Well, I brought something with me this morning. It's kind of a stick. It's, uh, it's made out of bamboo. It's quite light. Um, it's 18 and a half inches long. I measured it this morning, and it is an inch wide at its widest point. It's got kind of this curved thing on the end and some little uh, kind of teeth-like things here. There's a little hole on the other end. You can wave it around as a pointer. I can tell you a lot of things about this. I can give you the dimensions as I did. I didn't weigh it, but you know, it's light. I can tell you the weight. I can tell you the material. I can wave it around as I'm doing right now. It's kind of fun. Maybe I'll use this every week. <laughs> but really, if I was going to explain to you what this is, the easiest way to do it is to tell you what its purpose is. What this is, is a back scratcher. And it works very well. And I, I wanted to, to bring this as kind of a demonstration because you can talk of what something is about, what it's made out of, what its dimensions are. But what's really significant about it is not how much it weighs or how long it is. What's significant about it is its purpose. What is it for? And that's a segue to what we're going to talk about from God's word this morning. You know, we've been talking about creation, beginnings, how God has created things, what he's created, what his plan is. And we're still in the, the week of creation. We're actually still looking at day six of creation, specifically creation of human beings. And what we're going to look at from God's word, what God's word is going to tell us today is what is the purpose of humanity? Why did God create human beings? What are we for? Last time we looked at what it what you know, what what we are that God has created. What is it that we that God has created in human beings? What are we? Today we're going to talk about our purpose, our function. What are human beings created? Four. What is our purpose? So if you would, if you have a Bible, would you follow along with me? We're going to wrap up Genesis chapter 1. So we're going to look at verses 28 through 31. But I want to start reading, just go back to what we looked at last week. We're going to start with verse 26. And I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. So follow along with me if you would. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This food will be for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having breath having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So we come to the conclusion of the sixth day of creation, the last day that God created. And we find at this pinnacle of God's creation, an explanation of what humankind was created for. What is our purpose? And there's three things we're going to look at together this morning. The first is that God created mankind to abundantly fill out his creation. Look at the first part of verse 28. So after God creates human beings, male and female, in his image, we talked about that last week, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So what we see here is that when God created, it's not as though 
God had filled out all of the creation and everything was done and he just created human beings and said, okay, sit here and enjoy it, everything being done. It's not as though the earth was completely filled with plants and animals and human beings. And I think we don't think about this very often. We kind of have this picture of like, okay, all everything was filled and then he created human beings. But think about it. How many human beings did God create? Two. Now that's not very many when you think about filling the whole earth. So when you think about it that way, it helps you to understand what God did is he created everything and then he puts human beings on the earth and he gives them a commission to fill out the creation, to abundantly fill it. Look at the words that he used. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. This is the blessing, that they would reproduce, that they would be fruitful, that they would become many and numerous and fill out the whole earth. Think about the outward motion of that. As we know, God, we're going to get to it in chapter 2, but God placed them in the garden, this one specific spot. This is their home. But there's an outward motion that's pictured here. He created them. This go out and fill out the whole earth. Start in this one place and move out from there to the ends of the earth. Now, does that ring any bells in your head of other things in Scripture? of other acts of new creation. Do you hear the voice of Jesus when he sends his disciples out at the end of his ministry, after the resurrection, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, when he says, Go, therefore, unto all the world. Or in Acts chapter 1, where where he says to the disciples that you will be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. When Jesus commissions the church to go out bringing the message of the gospel, it is not a new idea that the work of his human creations should be to bring fullness to the earth. So it's God, has, God created it God made it, it's his, it belongs to him, but then he's placed his human partners on the earth to continue that work of filling, completing, filling out the rest of it. Now, don't miss the blessing of God here. The beginning of verse 28, God blessed them. Now, this is really significant. Blessing from a deity was really important. Because the options are you can be blessed or you can be cursed. And if you're blessed, good things will happen to you. And if you're cursed, bad things will happen to you. And it's like, it's sort of like, you know, the ancient people, that's what they wanted, right? That's what you hope for. That's what you work toward. You want to have blessing because then your life is going to go well. It's kind of like winning the lottery. You know, we have the lottery today. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be great to win the jackpot and you get all the millions of dollars? But that's only money. And money can buy a lot of things, but it can't buy you everything. The blessing of God is like if there was a lottery for health. You know, you could, oh, you won the lottery, and now you have perfect health. You know, all those metrics are good. You're fit. You're in shape. You're the right weight. You have energy all the time. You're going to, you know, feel good. You don't wake up with those aches and pains. And I felt that this morning. I woke up with you know, pain in, in the neck. It's like, oh, I slept too hard, you know. Wouldn't it be great if you could win the lottery and not have any of that? <laughs> it would, exactly. Or something else. Maybe there was a lottery you could win for relationships, where you just win the lottery and suddenly all the relationships that you have are, now there's harmony and peace. You know, not fighting, not the conflict, not the family feuds that have been going on for years, but everybody is, or, you know, there, if there was... If you could do this, you would get super rich. A lottery for wellness for your kids and grandkids. You know, how much would you pay to have all your kids be well and healthy and everything's going well and all your grandkids that way? Okay, this is what the blessings are. 
It's like winning the lottery, but not just for money, for all of those things. You'll have provision. You'll have good relationships. Everything you do will prosper. You'll be healthy and all of that. And that's what they're striving after, the blessings from the deity. But look here. If this isn't some false god, or this isn't some small local god or some parochial god, you know, this isn't just, oh, the god of, you know, this little area who can only take care of one thing. This is who? Who is it that's blessed these human creations? The God who created the universe. This is the whole context of what we've been talking about. Who spoke and light existed. And we go, I don't even know how that happens, how that works. This is the God who blesses his human creation. He's the God of all creation. This is, this is the jackpot of jackpots. When you have this blessing, what else do you need? Because you have that provision. And that blessing is for them to, to fill, to be fruitful, to multiply, to continue on. They're not going to be extinguished. Now, this idea of blessing of God is going to be central, really, to the whole book of Genesis, if not the whole Bible. It's reiterated to Noah in, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7. After the judgment, the waters of recreation, and Noah and his family, they get off the ark, and God blesses them. And he uses the same language to be fruitful and fill. It's really important. We'll get back to that. But it's not the idea that God hasn't destroyed them because there was too many. They got too raucous. He's like, okay, that, that I had too many that time. Let's wipe it off, start over. Now, Noah, this time, don't be so fruitful. You know, could you limit yourself to just a few and maybe you won't mess up? No, he gives him the same commission there. Fill it. So we realize the problem was not the number. The problem wasn't the filling. It was another problem. But that's, you'll have to stay tuned for that sermon when we get there. i got to have some self-control and not preach that sermon today. So it's in, it's in Genesis 9. It's in Genesis 12, the final section we're going to look at in this series. Think about it. You know the story. God comes to Abraham. He says, go to a land that I'm going to promise you. Leave your life behind. Go to this new land that I'm going to promise you. And I will make your name great. And I will make you a great nation. And later he elaborates. And I'll bless everyone through you. What does it sound like? It's this blessing of going forth and bringing fruit and bringing blessing. It even shows up at the very end of the book. Genesis chapter 48. Verse 4, where Jacob, Israel, is in Egypt with all of his family. You know, he's old. He's about to die. And he has been reunited with Joseph, and all his family is there. And he brings this up again. He talks about the fruitfulness of God and the multiplying. And then what's the first story in Exodus? And the Israelites are multiplying like nobody's business. And it's making the Egyptians worried. We're going to get overrun by these people. See the connection of that to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blesses them and says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, this, this should be something that we kind of trace through. And it helps us to recognize that humanity won't be wiped away. They won't be wiped off the face of the earth. You know, we have this fear it was really a strong fear. Those of you who lived through, you know, post-World War II and the Cold War and the nuclear arms race, and if you read anything from that time or you remember that time, it's like, we're going to blow each other up and we're all going to die. But humanity is not going to be wiped off the face of the earth. Why? Because of God's blessing. Now, we can do terrible things to each other, and we do that. But... Humanity is blessed. This is part of the reason why God rescues Noah. He doesn't have to do that, right? He could have just wiped them all out and said, okay, let's start with something else. Or, I'm going to make a new creation. You know, wipe all those people out. We're going to start over. But no, he rescues some out to start again because God has blessed. 
And what God has blessed, nothing can overturn that. Nothing can challenge that. Because God is powerful, and his word accomplishes. When he speaks, it takes place. Now, we tend to take the, the blessing of God way too lightly. It is all kind of ho-hum, oh yeah, God's blessed me. Or, you know, God's blessed me, but I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, maybe he'll reverse it, or he's going to pull the rug out from under me. He doesn't do that. We take the blessing of God too lightly. For people who understood this, I mean, their minds would be just, they, you know, they'd be exploding because this God, the God of creation, who created the lights and set them in motion, did all, he's blessed us. It's true. God has blessed humanity. And when he speaks, it's carried out. So what we should do then, think about this, Keep this in our minds as we go through the book of Genesis, the beginning part of Genesis together, and look to see where do we see this blessing of God that he's pronounced, where is it, where is it coming into play? How is it working itself out? Because we tend to look at it and say, well, it must just go away. No, it doesn't go away. God's blessing stays. It continues. So look to see those places, and we can see it all over as we move forward. The blessing of God in fulfilling this commission. So he's called us, he's, he's created human beings, mankind, and then blessed them, gave, given them this commission. Be fruitful, be abundant, grow to be many, fill out this creation. It's kind of like, you know, I was thinking about it, it's like um, when there's a new, you know, a new building that's built or a new house that's built or you clear some area or whatever and you have to, you have to plant, you want to plant some plants or shrubs or trees or something. And you have this kind of open space. And you don't plant things just totally full. You plant them so that they will grow and fill out. It's like a trellis. You know, you plant a trellis, you plant, and you have this structure built so that the plants can grow and fill it out. That's the design. And that's what God is saying here in creation. He's built the structure, and he's put human beings here. He said, okay, now you fill it out, fill it in. Bring it to fruitfulness. Bring it to fullness. That's how he has created us. Because this is really important because there's a false mindset today that's so common that you hear. And that is the idea that human beings are some kind of light, you know, on the planet. Like we're an invasive species that's here and we're just, you know, we're, all, we're endangering everything and um, we're like weeds that you want to make sure, you know, get the weed killer out and spray. We got to keep, um, that's this mindset that is very, it's just in the background. People don't even think about it. It's so common that human beings are just, and you know, nature would be better off if we weren't here. You know, that the fewer human beings there are, the better the creation would be. Like, did we hear that told? That, but it's a false idea. It's a lie. It directly contradicts Genesis 1.28. It directly contradicts God. God doesn't look at humanity and go, oh man, well, I, that was a mistake. I introduced that species and now they've ruined everything. No, God blesses the human beings. He says, fill now, there is a light, but it comes from the human heart. It's sin that we'll look at when we get to chapter 3 of Genesis. But we have to get the correct God mindset, biblical mindset. Human beings are not a blight on the creation. God created us to care for it, to cultivate it, to tend it, to be fruitful, to be multiplied. Now, that is not to say that human beings can't cause harm. Yes, we can cause harm. We do cause harm. If we started a nuclear war, that would, that would cause a lot of harm, and that would be against what God wants. But we have to, what is it if we want to remove the plants that the master gardener has planted there to multiply and fill out the space. We just think, no, we don't want those. We're just going to cut them off. 
That's what it is in the mindset when we don't appreciate what God has created in human beings. God has created mankind to abundantly fill out the creation. The second thing is that God created mankind to exercise righteous authority over the earth. This is the second half of verse 28. So God said in his blessing, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So he, he wants human beings to abundantly fill out his creation, but also he gives them the commission to exercise righteous authority over the earth. Now, to subdue something, that means to bring something under control. It's not out of control, it's not going off in chaos, but it is brought under control. It makes sense when you think about this from the broad picture. Why? It has been a few weeks ago. But why is it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it talks about you know, the water, the chaos, and the darkness, and all. You go, why is it talking about God creating in, in that? Because it connects with our commission. Because God has called us to subdue and to rule. So even here in the creation, before the fall, there is work to be done. There are things that need to be directed. There are efforts that need to be expended to subdue. So it brings something under control. And to rule means to exercise authority. We have authority over creation, over the animals, which interestingly are the, the last creation before human beings. And as you see, the creation, it becomes more and more significant, more and more heightened. And so God calls us to rule over the animal kingdom, we could call it, which is the closest in relationship to human beings. He gives us authority to exercise them. So when you combine these ideas, subdue and rule, it's the idea of bringing order and flourishing. You know, anybody who's ever had a flower garden or a vegetable garden knows that you have, you have to subdue it. You have to rule over it. Because if you don't, it doesn't flourish. It doesn't do well. And that's what it's talking about. So combined, it's the idea of bringing order and flourishing to creation. In reality, this is what my mom meant when she said to me when I was a kid, go clean your room. She could have said, subdue it. Rule over it. Bring it under control. Exercise authority over it. Right? Bring order and flourishing. That's what it means. So that's what God calls human beings to do over the earth, over the, the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the creatures that move on the earth. Have you ever wondered why it is that we as human beings are so good at technological advancement? You know, why it is that we can create all the things that we can create? that we can manage creation in certain ways, the technological advances that we have, you know, drones that can fly around and airplanes that can carry human beings in the sky to understand uh, the, the mysteries of the universe, to peer into those things too. Microbiology and understanding the gene to technology like cell phones and the communication tools that we have. Why is it that human beings are so good at this? Now, we tend to think, well, you know, because we're so advanced today. You know, we've progressed and we have all these things, so we're so advanced and we know uh, how to do all this because we're so smart. When, in fact, the reason why is not because we've made progress. It's because human beings were made for this purpose. God created us for the purpose and with the ability to rule over creation, to subdue it, to understand it, to study it, to test it, to guide it, to manipulate it, to, to bring it about to the ends that we want to bring it about to. We were created that way by God. That's our purpose. And, and that's why we can do all the great things that we can do. The technological advances that we have, the medicine that we have, the things that promote so people can have food and they can have medicine and all that kind of stuff the reason we can do it is not because we're so smart, but because we've changed so much from what we were. The reason we have all these things is because it's a, 
part of our purpose. God created us this way. And those things should be used for good purpose. But like all authority, the authority that we have can be used rightly or it can be misused. And of course, very shortly in the story, in the text, we're going to see that human beings misuse their authority. They wanted to become their own gods, to follow after their own hearts, and plunged the world into sin and death. So the question is, what is this authority supposed to be like? You know, so we have rule and authority so we can exert our iron will upon creation and get what we want? Well, first of all, it comes from God. So it's delegated authority. It's not ultimate authority. And so if it's for carrying out his will. So he gets to set the parameters. And also, we can look to see how does God use his authority? How is it that God exercises authority? We want to know how we should carry out our authority. How does God exercise his authority? Is it for self-promotion and self-fulfillment? Is God just here just to make himself happy and just kind of have a nice time? How does God use his authority? Not for himself. And what we're going to see next, in the next point this morning, God provides food, is that God gives for others. How does God use his authority? For himself and selfish purposes? No. God uses his authority to benefit others, his creation, the people around him. And it's evident right here in Genesis, we're going to look in a second, but also it's evident all throughout Scripture, and it finds its ultimate expression in Jesus Christ. The one who says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he uses that authority to do what? Make himself happy. Make him have a convenient life. They never have to have any suffering or any troubles. No. He gives himself on the cross. He suffers. He bears the sin of humanity. That's how he uses authority. That's the picture. So any place where we have authority, that's how we should use it. We should use it for others. In Genesis, in the Genesis account, this authority means to tend and care. Or in chapter 2, verse 15, to cultivate and keep. That's the commission that he gives. Cultivate and keep. To tend and and to care. So God's authority is used. This authority that we have is supposed to be sacrificial on account of others. So I'm going to give you a couple of just two scenarios to think about what it means in terms of how we should rule in our authority. Imagine a situation where you're, you know, you're at work and everybody's just sitting around, you know, the break room, the boss is somewhere else, and you're all like complaining about the boss. And if you've ever been in that situation, you don't have to admit it publicly here, but, um, <clears throat> and you say something like, you know, the boss is always, they're just always ordering people around and it's always their way and they never listen to anyone. When I'm the boss, and imagine a scenario where the words that follow are, when I'm the boss someday, you know, I'm going to be in charge and everyone's going to listen to me and do what I want and I'm not going to have to listen to anybody. Or, Say, when I'm the boss someday, I'll make sure to listen to people so they feel heard before I make decisions. See the difference in those two attitudes about authority? Because we can complain about authority. Oh, you know, so I'm, I'm gonna, I want to be the boss so everybody can listen to, to me and do what I have to say. Versus authority that's used for someone else. This is how we should think about authority. And... This is one of the issues that I think has been often misunderstood, misused, in, in even in Christian circles. That we think authority means that I get to get what I want. That I get to do what I want. And God cares fiercely about how authority is used or misused. Because it's delegated authority from him. And we all have authority in different ways. Think about the authority of parents over their children. That's a clear, that all throughout scripture. One of the Ten Commandments, children, obey your parents. Why does God give that authority structure? Well, it's for our good. But God entrusts that authority to parents 
For what? So that they can get what they want? So that they can be happy? So they can be lazy? No, that authority is given to be used for the other, for the sake of the other person. Things like disciplining. You don't discipline your children because it's fun or because it's enjoyable. It's difficult to use your authority in those ways to make good restraints. And that's what authority is supposed to be. It's, a, it's authority that's supposed to be used for the purpose of benefiting others. As a parent, you sacrifice, you do difficult things for your children because you care for them. That's the kind of thing God has given humanity. That's our purpose. That's our, uh, what we were created for in this creation. To, to sacrificially parent and supervise the creation. So, what are we created for? What's our purpose? Well, our purpose is to fill out creation. Our purpose is to exercise authority over it. And then lastly, God created mankind to be provided for by him. Verses 29 through 31. Now look at that carefully. Be provided for by him. That's kind of an awkward way of putting it. But I put it that way on purpose because it points to the fact that our purpose is to be receivers. God created us to be provided for by him. That basically means that we have to receive from him. That he gives to us our purpose is to be receivers, recipients, not to provide for him. God didn't create us to provide for him. So he's saying, well, you know, I'm going to need somebody to take care of me in my old age, so maybe I better make some creations to take care of me. No. This is really significant because in the creation story of all the people, you know, the pagan nations and, and kingdoms and city-states around Israel, <clears throat> the Canaanites, the Egyptians, etc., etc. In all those stories, the gods created human beings to be their servants. Primarily in an area of providing food. So in all their stories, you know, oh, the gods get together and they do whatever they're going to do, you know. They say, well, we're going to make some creations. And those little creations, they're going to go on the earth and provide crops, and they're going to give food to us and wine to us and meat to us and cattle to us. That's the picture. Notice how starkly opposite this is in Genesis. And notice how it's related to the issue of food. What does it say? God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seeds. This food will be for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth, everything that has the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. Why so much? Why so many verses? So many words given over to this idea about that we have, you know, is he just saying, oh, this is, you know, make sure you eat these plants? The point of this is that God is the provider. He doesn't say, okay. Humankind, I've created you, I've given you all this, go, go off, and, but make sure you bring me some. No, he says, I'm going to give to you. God is the provider. Notice this is before the fall. This is before sin has entered in. So the idea that we receive from God is not just because we're sinners. It's inherent to our nature. It will be the case for our entire existence, in our life today and in the future, when we're no longer sinful. It's not like when we go to heaven and say, oh, see you, God, we don't need you anymore. No, actually, what that will be is we will perfectly depend on him because our problem is that we look to so many other things to provide for us, to be our significance, and that's the issue. But God provides for us. He, he doesn't need us. He didn't create us so that we could be his servants. He created us, and then he provides for us. Notice verse 29. This is interesting. It starts with the word look in my translation. Maybe behold in yours. This is all throughout the Bible. You know, behold. Or in the old uh, language, lo. L-O. Lo, I bring you good tidings. Behold. See. Look. 
which is an interesting, interesting way of pointing attention to something that we shouldn't miss, but we should observe and we should think about and we should wonder at and we should understand the significance of. And in verse 29, this is the first behold in the Bible. The first thing to look, see how this is set up. And what is it? God says, I've given you food. Isn't that great? God has provided that, that provision for us. And the language is the same as when he created it. So he's not limiting it because it brings up the fruit and the seed. It's not like he's saying, okay, these are the plants for you, the fruit that has seeds in it. No, that's all of them. Because he's, he's talking about before he brought up the seeds because they reproduce. So why is he bringing it up here? He said, oh, I make this food for you. And by the way, it's food that reproduces itself. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, if the food in your refrigerator just reproduced itself? You know, oh, the milk jug is empty. Well, throw that one away. Tomorrow there'll be a new one. You know, or the pork chops in the freezer that you just leave them in there and they would multiply. That's the picture. But that's what it is in the, the plant. The fruit, you just, you know, it spills over, it dies in the ground, it grows up and produces more fruit. That's what he's saying. All the plants on the whole earth, all of these different kinds are your provision. Not only for human beings, but also for the animals. I think it's part of that work as we cultivate it and tend it and produce it and make it in different ways that then it produces for the animal creations too. Now, this is interesting. Plants are food. It, this is what it's saying in Genesis. Plants are food for humans as well as other creatures. No, it's not animals. This is oh, and I gave you the cows for hamburger, the beef. Because the plants are the food. So you go, well, where did the carnivorous animals come from? Well, it seems to be clear that comes from the fall. This idea of death and blood and things that we eat. So every time you see an animal that's torn apart by another animal, you know, the nature documentaries where the lion, you know, kills the gazelle, it's because of us. It was our sin that brought that death into the world. Why? Because of our dominion. When authority is misused, all of those under authority suffer as well. And death is a result of that fall. And it was not present before. Again, contradicting the story of evolution, that everything that we have here that we observe came about through a process of death and survival of the fittest. But that process of death is a result of human sin. Now, I know some of you are probably going to ask me this afterwards, so I'll just bring it up here. This doesn't mean we have to be vegetarian. Because as, as you, we're going to see, when we go through Genesis, there's particular places where God mentions that, and God inaugurates that. But we should look at that and say, hmm, because here in the creation story, God gives us plants for food, the abundance of that. And I look forward into the future to, you know, eating fruit from a tree that's as good or better than a steak. Because I think that's how it was here. But anyway, that, all of that death is a result of the fall. But let's not miss the point. God is providing. And he says this is very good. He saw everything that he made, all the days of creation, as it comes to completion. This is very good. And it closes out, evening and morning, the sixth day. So what is this saying? Well, God is saying, look, I'm provided for you. And notice he created these plants way back on day three for us to be provided for. And this understanding that God created us to be provided for, not to provide for him, is really significant. It's like the difference between a baby and a Roomba. You know, the little vacuum cleaners that they just go, they're like little robots. And I hear they're really like fancy now. They just go and do their thing and they go back and empty themselves out and charge themselves up and all that kind of stuff. That those are created to serve us. And right? you're like, this is a little robot. Just clean my floors in the background. I don't even have to know about or think about you. You're there to serve me. But that's not, that's not what a baby is. A baby doesn't serve you, it needs to be served. 
That's why when you have little kids, you're really always tired out because they just demand your attention all the time to look at your noggin. <laughs> because the purpose, is they, they need to be provided for, cared for, and that's what God has created in us. We're like babies. We're not God's Roombas. He provides for us. He cares for us. He nurtures us. What does this mean? Well, we should not, don't try to be self-sufficient. We should never be like, well, I'm just trying to work my way out of needing God. No. Work your way into needing God more. Think about it. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation, is only available to people who will be receivers, not earners. You think, well, I'm going to get it. I'm going to live up to it. You can't get it. That's why Jesus says, unless you come like a child who offers nothing, except I have needs, you can't receive. And that's what we've been since the beginning. So we shouldn't try to be self-sufficient. We should recognize we are receivers of grace. That's what we are by our identity. That's our purpose, to receive from God. This is who we are. So when God created us, what is our purpose? He created us to fill out the creation. He created us to rule it righteously. And he created us to be provided for, to receive joyously from God. Let's pray.